From the Gospel of John, chapter 13, verse 1, we read, Before the Passover celebration, Jesus knew that his hour had come to leave this world and to return to his Father. He had loved his disciples during his ministry here on earth, and now he loved them to the very, very end. It was time for supper, and the devil had already prompted Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had given him authority over everything, and that he had come from God and would return from God. So he got up from the table, took off his robe, wrapped a towel around his waist and poured water into a basin. Then he began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel he had around him. Scene one, the Last Supper. It was a different kind of Passover, to say the least. Uh, I remember right when we sat down, Philip leaned over to me and he whispers, Hey, Thomas, I feel like something special is going to happen tonight. <laughs> I looked at him, I said, I doubt it. I was wrong. <laughs> Jesus got up from the table. He, he walked over and grabbed a basin of water and a towel. And I remember at the time thinking to myself, what's Jesus doing with the foot water? You know, I doubt he's going to wash somebody's feet. <laughs> I was wrong. He knelt down and began to wash Bartholomew's feet. Bart just sat there. He, uh, he didn't say anything. He didn't move. None of us did. Jesus finished and went on to James and Andrew and the rest of us. I remember at the time thinking, this is so strange, yet wonderful. And then I thought, I doubt anybody's going to say anything right now. I was wrong. You know who broke the silence. Peter. No way you're going to wash our feet. I mean, that's what I told him. He could wash other people's feet, but he wasn't going to wash mine. I looked at him and I said, Jesus, you're not going to wash our feet. I mean, you're the king. And he looked at me and he said, well, then you can have nothing to do with me. And I'm like, ouch. Okay, wash my feet, wash my hands, wash my whole body if you have to. He looked at me and said, no, your feet will be fine, Peter. In the midst of him washing our feet, he teaches us servanthood. Then Jesus took some bread and some wine. He blessed it and he served it to us. He said it was... Uh, a new covenant with his blood. And he said, um, tonight, all of you will lose faith in me. I remember thinking right then, lose faith in you? Never. But I didn't say anything. I just sat there. I couldn't just sit there. I had to say something. So I looked at him and I said, Jesus, I love you. You can count on me. Everybody else may fall away, but I will not. You can count on me. He looked at me and he smiled. And he said, Peter, you'll deny me three times for tomorrow morning. Ouch. The next thing I knew, we were wrapping things up and we were headed to the garden to pray. Betrayed by his own. The sin of man and wrath of God were laid squarely upon his shoulders. Jesus obeyed his father to death, even to death on a cross. In Matthew 26, 30, we read, Then they sang a hymn and went out to the Mount of Olives. On the way, Jesus told them, Tonight all of you will desert me, for the scriptures say, God will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. Scene 2, the garden at the Mount of Olives. Once we got to the garden, um, it just got crazy. Um, Jesus asked Peter, James, and myself to go further in the garden with him and pray, and we did. We tried. We kept falling asleep. Um, Jesus kept waking us up. I remember one time he said, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. That's true. It's all a blur. Uh, and I think this whole mess got started because of Judas. Did he really think what he was doing was right? There. There he is. He's the one you want. The one praying by himself. Now the others, they will come up and try to create some scene. But the one that I kiss on the cheek, that's the one you want. 
Now, 30 pieces of silver, right? That's what we agreed upon? 30 pieces. Forget about the rest. The one that I kiss on the cheek. That's the one you want. A kiss? Judas betrays Jesus with the kiss of a friend? Uh, and then it, it got crazy. Uh, Peter... <laughs> Peter grabs a sword and he he cuts off this guy's ear. And Jesus Jesus reached down and picked it up and put it right back on the guy's head as if nothing had happened. And then um, and then they took him. I'd love to tell you that we fought for him. but we didn't. Everyone ran. I ran. I'm so ashamed. What have I done? What have I done? Was I so stupid to think that I've killed him. I've killed him. I've crucified Jesus. Christ died for us. By his wounds we are healed. Matthew 26, 57 we read, Then the people who had arrested Jesus led him to the home of Caiaphas, the high priest, where the teachers of religious law and the elders had gathered. Meanwhile, Peter followed him at a distance and came to the high priest's courtyard. He went in and sat with the guards and waited to see how it would all end. Scene three, Peter's denial. They say a rooster crowing is God's wake-up call. Yeah, that's, uh, at least that's the way it was for me. Everything, that, that whole night was a blur, all right? Um, I didn't comprehend, none of us could comprehend everything that was going on, all right? We were all in the upper room, Jesus was washing our feet. Um, then we were in the garden, Jesus goes off to pray by himself. I fell asleep. I'm not proud of it. I had a big meal. Bread makes me sleepy. Next thing we know, me, James, and John, Jesus is in our face, and he's trying to wake us up, and uh, he said, um, he said uh, the, the, uh, the flesh is weak, the spirit is willing, and, and then before we know it, Judas is kissing Jesus on the cheek. I try to go help him. I cut off this guard's ear. For the record, I wasn't aiming for his ear. I'm a fisherman, not a swordsman. And then they, uh, they arrest Jesus, and they take him off, and we... We ran. And it wasn't but two hours earlier that we were in the upper room. I was looking at him. I was looking him right in the eye saying, if everyone disowns you, Jesus, I won't. I'm with you. I love you. And I think that's what made me stop, turn around, go back. And uh, I caught a glimpse of Jesus as they were taking him to the high priest's house. Stood at the gate, and some girl comes up to me, starts pointing at me, starts going, you, you're with him. You're with this man that claims to be the son of God. You're one of his disciples. I felt like every eye was on me. So I just brushed her off. I said, you don't know what you're talking about. You got the wrong guy. I get my way into the courtyard, and uh, it's cold. I, I try to warm up by the fire. And then there's this guy that recognizes me, and he is uh, from the ear incident, you know, and starts going, get him, get him, he's with him. Just arrest him, get him. And I'm like, you don't know what you're talking about, all right? I wasn't with him. It was easier the second time to deny him. 
It was sometime right before morning, and um, this wise guy, he comes up to me and goes, Who are you kidding, all right? Who are you fooling? You're with him. I can tell by your accent. I'm like, this is just the way I talk, all right? And, and the whole night, they kept pushing him around. They kept beating him. They kept spitting on him, throwing insults at him, and I couldn't take it anymore. I had enough. I was tired of people accusing me, looking at me, and I, and I just I said a few things that I'm not proud of, but I was like, leave him alone. You don't know what you're doing, all right? Just leave him alone. I wasn't with him. And that's when I heard the most blood-curdling sound I ever heard in my whole life. I heard that rooster crow. And at that moment, Jesus, he turns around and he looks at me. He looks at me. And his gaze, you can't escape his gaze. I mean, when his eyes are on you, you cannot escape it. And they arrested him and they took him off. I will die with you, Jesus. As everyone, if everybody disowns you, I will die with you. What a, what a joke. I mean, what would you do? At that moment, at that time, I ran. I ran so fast, I ran so long. And you know what they did? They killed him. He's dead. Words are hard, aren't they? They're powerful. They mean a lot. Uh, over time, we can deny Christ, not just with our words, but with our deeds our priorities, our actions, what motivates us. And yet Jesus is the king who died because he knew that's what we're like. He gave up his life because God knows what we are. He knows we're frail. We're not as strong as we think we are. From the Gospel of Luke, chapter 23, verse 17, we read, Pilate called together the chief priests, the leaders and the people and said to them, you've brought me this man as one who misleads the people. But in fact, after examining him in your presence, I've found no grounds to charge this man with those things you accuse him of. Neither has Herod because he sent him back to us. Clearly, he has done nothing to deserve death. Therefore, I'll have him whipped and I'll release him to you. And they all cried out together, Take this man away! Release Barabbas to us! He'd been thrown into prison for a rebellion that had taken place in the city and for murder. Scene 4, Golgotha. I crucified Jesus. It's what the crowd wanted and that's what they got. And personally, I don't feel like that man did anything to deserve that, but... I was just a soldier doing my job. When the governor gave his sentence, that's when I would go to work. I loved that job. I felt like I was administering justice every time I nailed someone to a tree. That man, that man didn't deserve that. It didn't make sense to me. It makes no sense. There I was, rotten in a jail cell, for stealing, murdering. You name it, I've done it. And I knew the next time I stepped foot outside that jail cell, well, and that was it. So the guards, they came and got me and they put me beside this guy that was beaten to a pulp. Then Governor Pilate started asking the crowd, which one of these men do you want me to set free? I mean, it was obvious. I mean, the crowd, they're gonna say, let Jesus go. And then I was going to tell them where they could go. And then the crowd, they started chanting Barabbas. I mean, I mean, they were saying my name. They were saying my name over and over and over again. 
the guards, they threw me to the crowd, and they, and they, and they took Jesus to Golgotha. I mean, one minute, I, I am a man marked for death, and then the next, I'm, I'm free. It made no sense. So I followed him all the way to Golgotha. I was stationed at Golgotha that day. We just raised the second criminal when they brought him to me. I'll never forget the way he looked. He'd been beaten, spit on, whipped. He was unrecognizable as a man. Hideous. What was left of his clothes were stripped off of him and he was thrown down on the cross. That's when I went to work. Generally, when you crucify a man, the first hand is the most difficult. The criminal wants to get away, he fights you. So I would have two soldiers hold him down, but this guy, he didn't put up a fight. I just thought he was exhausted. As an executioner, I've been called every name in the book. I've had men yell at me, plead with me. But I wasn't prepared for that. He looked at us. He looked at me. And he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He forgave me. Forgive them. He said, forgive them. Who is he? Forgive. It should have been me up there. I was the one that was supposed to be hanging on that cross. He took my place. Then I looked up, and I remember he took a uh, deep, agonizing breath, and he said, it is finished. And then, he died. Surely. This man was the son of God. The servant king, Christ, God's saving king, dies for us. By his wounds, we are healed. Good Friday is much more than hot cross buns. It's that a real man, on a real day, died on a solid wooden cross. But unlike every other person who's ever hung on a cross, this, this was an innocent man, God's own son. Jesus who died so that our debt of guilt could be paid. You see, we're all in desperate need of help. We all fail to give God the obedience owed to him, to give him the honour and praise he alone is due. We've all ignored his good rule over our lives when it's convenient. We've ignored him. Perhaps we've even denied him. And it's a rebellion which leads to brokenness and death. However, our debt of guilt before God can be paid if only we would allow Jesus to pay it for us. My prayer is that you have already looked to the cross of Jesus on that first Good Friday, that you've asked God to place your debt of guilt upon that cross and asked for his mercy and forgiveness. Because if we have, if you have, the Bible tells us that God is faithful and just to forgive us completely and to make us clean once more. Well, thank you very much for joining us today. If you've heard something or, uh, or seen something today that's raised in you uh, a question or something to talk about, please have a chat with me after the service. Maybe have a talk to one of the elders or a good Christian friend that you know. Leave a message on, on, on our Facebook page or contact me on the number that's there. Because this willing sacrifice of God's son, while it cost God greatly, is good news for us in Jesus. Today truly is a good Friday. I hope to see you this Resurrection Sunday. We're going to celebrate Jesus' victory over sin and over death, 9.30 a.m. online or here at 30 Bain Street. Let's finish with a prayer of thanks. It will be one last time 
on the screen.